J2F Duck meets Aero L39 Albatross, Duckatross? Well, why not? This Duckatross's base airframe is the Motion RC Freewing L39. The main float is one of the floats from the Flex Innovations RV860 size model, and the sponsons, the floats on the wings, are fuel tanks from another airframe. Our friend and mentor Brian did all the great work on the conversion. He even was able to shave out over a pound and a half of weight by removing unnecessary hardware, such as the landing gear. In prep for the flight, Brian and I briefed a couple potential concerns. Sponsons. They were built light and therefore were fragile. Would they hit the water and break off, leading to a nasty porpoise? Drag. Since there is a giant pontoon the size of the fuselage under the plane, the added drag below the plane may result in the plane wanting to pitch up naturally, especially at low air speeds and high angles of attack. We added down elevator trim by default and prep for this. Let's fly. My nerves were flowing, having traveled 3,000 miles for this flight. I started by taxiing her out and got her into position. This was a plane unlike anything I'd flown before, so I was definitely feeling outside my comfort zone. So, here goes nothing. With takeoff thrust set, I did my best to try and keep the wings level with what little airspeed I had, but our fears came to reality. A sponson very quickly snapped off, which started an oscillation that led to a nasty porpoise. Should I have aborted? Well, maybe, but Brian had stressed a fly or die this thing mentality during our briefing, so I decided that I would attempt to push through the porpoises. In the full-scale seaplane I instruct in, a sea ray, we teach to dampen porpoising by establishing a deck angle in which the hole hits the oncoming water after each bounce in a way that dampens the porpoise. This deck angle varies from plane to plane, and since I haven't flown the mighty Duckatross before, it was anyone's best guess as to what the sight picture even looked like. Ultimately, I was able to dampen the porpoise after a few bounces and then she leapt into the air. Close enough for government work. Despite the ugly takeoff, she was flying, and it was time to get some turns in and learn the plane as safely as I could with the time and space available. As we had guessed, the plane did want to pitch up quite a bit, especially at lower air speeds and higher angles of attack, hence that violent rotation despite the tiny amount of back pressure I used to rotate. No biggie though, just fly the plane. I trimmed the plane for about 60% power. It was fun flying her around seeing such an oddball of a float plane flying above the lake. What goes up must come down, so it was time to try and approach. I ended up finding myself applying down elevator, aka forward pressure, to round out the plane and flare in order to maintain the proper attitude for landing thanks to the draggy pontoon yet again. Since this was new airplane to me, I misjudged the approach path and ended up touching down pretty close to the shore. Abort. Yeah. That was close. Time to try her again. Much better, but rip sponsors. While the glue was drying on the sponsors, we had a good time flying some other fun float planes. First up, my Turbo Timber Evolution. I've been working on getting more and more comfortable hovering this bird up close and down low and decided to try some tail touches on the water. These always get the heart rate up and are definitely a fun challenge. Oh, look at that. <laughs> backing up, backing up, backing up. <laughs> Next up, our good friend Daniel took to the skies with his fly zone sea wind. You have anything to say about it, Daniel? I don't know. Hopefully I don't crash into another boat. This is uh, other than that, shit. You may recognize him because in the past, he was known for absolutely annihilating his prior sea wind by flying it into a sitting rowboat. Dummy. <laughs> well, that just happened. Well, he decided to redeem himself, and we're happy to say that no boats were damaged in the making of this flight. Whoa! <laughs> Ooh. The CA had now cured, so it was time to take the Duckatross up for its second flight. This time around, Julian offered to hold the tail at shore so I could set max thrust, aka holding the brakes per se, followed by having Julian release the plane. The idea here was hoping that this would allow airspeed to build quicker to make the ailerons effective, keeping the wings level but not dragging those poor sponsons through the water and end up porpoising again. Good call, Julian. Julian, why you look like an FBI agent? It worked like a charm, but somehow, I still lost the sponsor. RIP. The flight went great, I got in some passes, and once again did the counterintuitive landing via forward pressure to round out and flare. It's time to yet again glue back the sponsons and let them dry. So let's get in some more flying with other birds again. Ian offered to let me take a flight on his beautiful electrified SIG Cadet on floats. This bird has a Flex Innovation 70 size brushless motor and flies on a 6S5000 pack. This was definitely a great change from the odd characteristics of the Duckatross, and in fact, it was the most scale flying RC float plane I've probably flown. The way that she truly landed on step and as the plane decelerated, slowly but surely came off of step and settled into the water, looked just like the real thing. Thanks for the flight, Ian. 
Last up, our favorite not armchair engineer, Woody, donated one of his awesome scratch-built designs he did back in 2009 while in his early days as an aero engineer. RC is an awesome way to learn a lot firsthand about aero engineering concepts, and with this plane, Austin's mission was to create a pusher float plane that has a high thrust line that doesn't have the annoying pitching tendencies most float pushers are known to have. In other words, the nose wanted to go down when you increase the power and up when you decrease it. He was successful, and this plane was also incredibly light and flew amazing. She even made for a great roller too. Thanks for the plane, Woody. Well, it's time. The glue had dried, Brian had told us he needed to leave soon, so we had time to get in one more flight. Now, everyone in RC knows the term one more flight is jinx, but we really didn't care. It was fly or die yet again, and the takeoffs you're about to see are the definition of that. Yeah. Josh, we can't see the airplane, bro. You're blocking it. You gotta get it on your left. So somehow, after all that, annihilating both sponsons and dragging oh, wingtips through the water, she was able to get topside. I found a gentle kick back and forth with the rudder ended up helping quite a bit. I had a good time flying her around one last time and then brought her in. However, this flight, it was clear that the abuse on the water had shifted the battery around, thus moving the CG pretty far back, and she was really wanting a nose up on the final. I did the best I could, all things considered, and set her down. Okay. And that's the tail heavy production's way. <laughs> oh my god. Phew. The L39 Ducatross taught us a lot about trial and error, and affirmed our belief that flying outside the box is what this hobby is all about. Purposely trying something that isn't commonly tried, and pushing ourselves outside our comfort zones, led to a really fun day at the lake for everyone. Ultimately, Brian decided that while the single float EDF Ducatross was a fun concept to give a try with, it was time to go back to the standard twin pontoon setup that we initially tried out on floats with the Viper 70mm from E-Flight. Our next float EDF subject is going to be even bigger, so stay tuned. If you enjoyed this video, consider pressing the like and subscribe buttons. Happy landings, and bounce one on for us. See you next time with a new upload.